Well, Graham Justified ended here a couple of weeks ago after six seasons. Um, tell me, now that the finale is aired, what has been the reaction from people that you know? Um, <clears throat> you know, the reaction's been pretty good, and uh, we're very, uh, very pleased with that because you never know. Um, you know. There's a lot of pressure, I think, now in the world of television to end a series well, and, uh, you know, that was certainly our goal. Um, and, but you don't know how it's going to work or not going to work until people see it. We were lucky enough, we got to show it to a big group of people in Harlan. Joel was there and Jacob Pitts and a bunch of the writers. Uh, we showed it to them the weekend before the uh, finale aired, and that was the first time we saw it with an audience, and that was, that was a lot of fun. Uh, to hear them gasp when Raylan got shot and uh, cheer when Ava drove off and other moments throughout the show. So that gave us a good feeling. And then when we showed it to an audience in L.A. Uh, the Monday before the, the finale aired, uh, we also got a good response. And then, you know, critically, people seem to have enjoyed it, and I've gotten a lot of nice emails and texts. So I guess, you know, we, I mean, we feel pretty good, I guess. Having shown it to two big audiences there in advance, how in the world did the secrets not get out? Yeah, you know, people were pretty good about that. We asked uh, before the, the Harlan event, and we said, you know, please don't uh, go on social media about this until, you know, Tuesday evening after the episode is aired. And the same thing was said to the audience on the, on the Monday night. And, you know, I think that it depends on what the show is. I. I you know, it's going back into to my youth. Uh, it's not quite who shot Jr. Um, and you know, who lives and who dies. That, that's important um, for our show, but it was really more how we told the story than, than the actual mechanics of what happened. And I think that people uh, enjoyed it enough that they didn't want to spoil it, with you know, to the extent that it could be spoiled. Well, speaking of, uh, you know, your three main characters, uh, Raylan and Boyd and Ava, when along the way did you decide that all three of them would, would survive the series? We started to figure out how the series would end uh, when we were working on uh, actually season five. But really drilling down into how that final episode would go, we started thinking about that last summer. And... You know, it was in discussions with Tim and, and, and with Walton and with Joel where we, we qu quickly realized that if, if Raylan was to kill Boyd as much as he might want to and as much as Boyd might deserve it, um, then really Raylan's learned nothing over the course of the six seasons. So that, that, as soon as we figured that out, then we roughly knew how the, how the thing was going to end. We, we didn't want to kill off Raylan, and boy, we sure didn't want to kill off Ava. And a lot of it really came back to how Elmore Leonard uh, would end his books. Um, very rarely, but I can't even think of an instance where the protagonist dies. Um, sometimes, often, the, the main bad guy will, um, but not always. You know, he'll keep him around sometimes, like Ordell, um, you know, to keep him around so he can kill him off and run punch, which became Tarantino's movie Jackie Brown. Um, and often the women get away sometimes with the money and sometimes they just get away with their lives. So it sort of felt like it was in Elmore's world to end it that way. And the character of uh, Wynn Duffy, I, I don't know how in, how in the world he got out of, that, out of that RV and also out of the season. He, he lives. He's, he's like the really only, the, the only bad guy. Well, I guess you'd call Boyd a bad guy, but of the guest star kind of bad guys, he's the only one, I guess, that kind of survived. Yeah, there's a thing in Elmore that character is destiny, and people end up doing the same thing again and again. Raylan, uh, in the early books, you know, he lost uh, uh, Harry Arno a couple of times. Um, uh, he, you know, and Harry became a fugitive. And so we felt that when, the thing that Wynn Duffy does again and again is survive. Uh, we always call him the, the human cockroach. I don't know if Jerry Burns appreciated us calling him that, but... Uh, there was a sense that that's what Wynn Duffy does, is he survives one way or another. And, you know, listen, he was a character that was supposed to die. I mean, he got shot in season one. He was supposed to die in season two. Um, and then even in season three. So we kept on, you know, sparing him from the, from the gallows. 
But uh, when we got down to the end of it, we thought it would be cool if he was instrumental in, uh, in getting Ava out of Harlan. And Lord knows where he is now in our world. What, and maybe I missed it. I hope I didn't miss it. Maybe you could expound on it a little bit. What exactly, of all the money that, that, that was hidden, what did he get and what did Ava get? You know, we honestly didn't land on a particular financial arrangement between them. Uh, knowing Wayne Duffy, we could imagine that he got her out and got the location of where the money was buried in the hills. Um, and he probably gave her a little spending money, got her out of Kentucky, got her someplace into the West, and let her go. And then, this is just my imagination, that Wynne Duffy would have just sat tight and waited a year or two before somehow he got up into those hills and found the money. Um, and, and so, or he didn't. Um, we don't, you know, we don't know. We never really landed on it. It's possible that he never found the money that someone else had gotten it before he got there or that, you know, he just couldn't follow Ava's instructions. So we never, we honestly never worked it out into the room, uh, in the room, exactly what happened to win. Okay. Sometimes when I'm watching these shows and movies, sometimes something will slip right by me. And that's why I wanted to ask that. And it's, so it's, it's a, a question mark that'll hang probably forever. Yes. You, whatever our own imagination is, that's what happened. Yeah. Speaking of him and other people you've had on, like Pat Oswalt to Mike O'Malley, and you've you've employed a lot of um, people, I guess, comedic type actors to play villains, to play uh, the different roles on the show beyond the main characters. Is that a, was that something on purpose? Yes, it was. Um, I you know I think we quickly realized that if we're going to do an Elmore Leonard show, uh, we needed to have actors who could be funny. Um, and, you know, Tim, Walt, and Joel all had ex experience with doing comic turns. Um, that was very helpful. I knew Jacob was funny. I knew Nick Cersei was funny. Eric is funny. Uh, so our core group was, you know, had people who could get the joke and deliver in that Elmore way, which is he insisted no one ever laughs at an what another character says, and they're not doing it for laughs. That's just the way they speak. Um, and then that became, you know, sort of a guiding force throughout the series. It was in season one when Wynne Duffy first appeared and it was Cammie Patton, our casting director's idea. She said, what about Jerry Burns? And I just thought it was great. I thought having, uh, someone who can be very funny play someone who is very evil, um, often works well. Um, so that was, that was, so that sort of started something for us. Um, and then getting Pat and Oswald, that just came out of us hearing that he was a fan of the show and that he was tweeting about it. And so we reached out to him and uh, we came up with that character of Constable Bob specifically for him. Well, I, we've, I mean, all these decades of entertainment, I mean, comedians can often do dramatic material, but it doesn't work the other way around all the time. Right. It's, it's, it's very hard to teach comedy um, and for... Uh, but that doesn't mean that straight actors can't find it. I mean, you know, Leslie Nielsen didn't play comic roles until he started into the whole, I don't think he did much anyway until he got into the naked gun work. Um, and then he, you know, he was hysterical. Um, but yeah, it's, it, it can often be pretty rough if uh, you get a, you know, truly dramatic actor trying to be funny. Um, and it, one of the good things about Elmore is that the characters, you know, are never really trying to be funny, as I said, but that's just the way they are. I think that's why so many of those actors did that so well, is it is all about the rhythms and comedy is all about rhythms. Yeah, I mean, you know, Sam Elliott has done comic bits in movies and has been funny, but I think the, the fun of him playing Markham is that he plays them very straight and at times it comes off as so, um, you know, rich in a way that and he's so much that character that there it, it feels like there there's humor to it, um, you know, and that's part of making the the story enjoyable. Mary Steenburgen has done a lot of comedy over the years, and so she just fit in perfectly. <laughs> was there along the way? Uh, you had so many great guest stars. Was there anybody you pursued and it just didn't work out? Maybe timing or or you know whatever it was that you really wanted to have be on the show. Eric Stone Street. Um, 
Tim ran into Eric at some event, or they knew each other through something, and Eric's on uh, Modern Family. Uh, and, you know, he's, I think he grew up in Missouri, uh, or somewhere in the Midwest. Uh, I think they've used that for his character Cam on, on Modern Family. Um, and, you know, he was interested, he loved the show and was really interested in, in being, uh, you know, doing a guest pop on it. And I think from seasons, I don't know if it was in season two, but certainly season three on, I would have his uh, schedule on, on my cork board here, uh, laying out when they were going to have a hiatus on, on Modern Family and to see if that synced up with an episode. And once or twice we had something that could maybe kind of sort of work, but it was never anything that really, you know, really would have taken advantage of having Eric Stone Street on the show. So it just ultimately didn't work out. So there were people along the way, maybe that did come on the show that that you just knew that they either, either they were a fan or they would be perfect for the show or whatever, and you would write roles specific to them that would that would be maybe an episode or maybe an arc or something like that. Yeah, I mean, you know, in the case of Patton, we he, you know, it's in the first episode of season four. We really didn't know how much we were going to use him, how much that character was going to go on beyond that first episode. And it just developed. It was just something where he was having fun on the show. We loved what he was doing as Constable Bob. You know, Patton is Patton. He'll come up with stuff and we'll just, you know, throw our hands in the air and say, that is so fantastic. We hadn't even thought of that. Um, saying things to Raylan like, stay frosty. And when he does the whole thing in the car, showing how he could stab Raylan if he tried to attack him, you know, and he said beef stew. And that was, that was Patton. And, and, so he was so much in the spirit of the show and the character was so wonderful that it, it's not as though we went, okay, now we're going to put him in the rest of the season, but it was like, okay, let's keep that in mind. And so when we came to plot points and we needed a story, the story to move in a certain way, we would say, yeah, okay, what about Constable Bob? And just like the other question I asked, did we, did we really find out what happened to him? Because that happened in the next to last episode with the, with the shooting. Uh, D Dave Andron uh, and I both uh, had this moment where we, uh, you know, we'd already shot the final episode and that sort of cold sweat moment where you're going to sleep and you go, wait a second, we didn't resolve what happened to Constable Bob. Um, in, in retrospect, you know, maybe we could have thrown a line in that direction. Um, you know, it's my basic feeling that unjustified, if you don't see a character zipped up in a body bag, then chances are they're fine. Um, and, and I think that also if we had thrown a line to that effect, if, uh, if Art had said to Raylan at some point, by the way, just so you know, Bob's doing fine, um, I think it would have just felt like that is what it was, that we were just answering that question mm -hmm. rather than being an organic part of the story. See, I, my mind went the opposite way. I thought, oh, they killed him, but they didn't have the heart to tell the audience. <laughs> no, no, Bob is, Bob is still alive in our minds. Okay, good deal. Um, for the whole six seasons, I know you know you get the writers all in the room. You get ideas from I'm sure other people. You got your own ideas. What was the craziest idea you ever pursued but didn't actually uh, put on the show? Um, A plot line or, or something that you really maybe were going after and 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 you realized it wasn't going to work or or you just didn't ultimately want to go down that road. You know, I mean, first of all, we had a very free and loose and fun room, and we would come up with all sorts of stuff that we would, you know, have no intention of doing. Um, and Tim would get into the spirit. He, he once pitched the notion that, you know, in this climactic moment, I think in season four, or so maybe it was five, I can't remember now, uh, he said, what if Iron Giant came in and this gigantic robotic foot came down? And he, you know, he was just joking. But we, we love to play with, with everything. I think the closest thing, though, to um, something that we almost did and then didn't do was in season three, and that's the season with where we meet Limehouse and Robert Quarles comes in, played by Neil McDonough. So we've got two guys I've worked with on Boomtown, Michael T. Williamson and Neil McDonough. And we were going to have this episode in the bar where uh, that college bar that Raylan lives above for that season and, and actually into the next season. Um, and it was going to be unrelated to the main story of the season. And someone was going to take hostages in that bar because we really kind of needed a, what we call a bottle episode where we're just using our sets and focus it down into one set. 
and um, you know, it just was not right. Um, you know, it, listen, it would have been a fun episode, but at that point, we needed to keep the story going in terms of what was what was happening between Rail and the Corals and and how that was developing. And uh, it was Tim who was the first to raise the flag and say, "Guys, we just you know this is fun and all, but we just can't do this." Um, so we scrambled and we put together a good episode, but. Uh, you know that is one of those those paths not taken. I think it was a good choice, but yeah, that that would answer your question. Well, that's why you need people around you that you trust because maybe you do have a bad idea or, or something that that's not going to work, and you need you don't need yes people all the time. You need people that are going to tell you that, and that's that's good that he did that. Yeah, no, I never make mistakes, and uh, no, all the time, and and that was uh, one of the one of the great things about doing this show was having a room full of such uh, wonderful writers and, and just great people. We had a lot of fun together in the room. Um, but, you know, I'm sure there's times when people would be hesitant to raise their hand and go, Graham, that's, I don't think that's going to work. But after a while, it was just, you know, it was much freer than that. At least that was my intent. Um, and, you know, if I came up with something that was crazy, um, someone, you know, but that, that, that but, Part of the process can be you come up with something crazy and that thing isn't going to work but that one small part of it might <clears throat> and you know people would come up with stuff all the time and you know my catchphrase in the room uh became and i only became aware of it in the final season i didn't realize i'd been saying it for six years was maybe so someone would pitch something and i didn't really see it and i would say maybe and I intended it as a way of softly letting or letting someone down softly. But what actually happened was over the course of time is I would say maybe to something and then a week later in talking to Fred Golan about it or Taylor Elmore or Chris Provenzano or, 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 or Fred, um, you know, Ben Cavell, um, I would realize, wait a second, maybe that would work. Maybe we have to do this or not that or whatever. And that became part of the process. And, you know, back to the beginning of the show, you know, a, a show rides or, or falls on its, on its, especially if it has one lead, like Timothy here. How did you come to him and, and um, uh, just talk about working with him over this, this time? He was uh, top of the list when we were first trying to cast the, the pilot. Um, was Deadwood part of that, knowing that he had that Western following and background? Yes, absolutely. We knew he could wear a hat. He could, you know, shoot a gun. He could be tough. But for me, it was also films like, oh, I think it was called A Perfect Getaway. Um, and was he in Go? He was in Go. I don't think he was. Anyway, um, there, there was stuff that he had done, and, and also in the, in the Die Hard he was in. There was stuff that he had done that showed he could be very funny. He'd be very scary very dramatic he could also be sexy and it felt like with Raylan it was a, a combination of all of those elements I think that if you were casting Tim just off of Seth Bullock and Deadwood um, you know that would sort of be a mistake because he can do so much more and and does it very convincingly all these other things so he was top of the list but he was unavailable you know we were casting during um, you know regular network pilot season so it was you know, January of 2009, and everyone's trying to get that male lead, you know, age 30 to 45, um, and Tim wasn't available. He was doing a movie called The Crazies, and, you know, it was John Landgraf uh, more, I think, than anyone who said, you know what, let's just wait. Uh, we can put the season on. If, the, if it goes to series, we'll put it on in March. So we can shoot the pilot a little later. And so we waited until after Memorial Day. Uh, and then in terms of working with Tim, you know, he'd had some experiences on other projects, um, mostly films where he didn't really feel he was listened to and he felt that it was uh, a mistake. And so he vowed that he was going to be listened to. And, uh, you know, it was not easy. There were, there were some rough patches. Um, but we ended up working out, working it out. And, um, on the very last day of shooting uh, for Tim, 
uh, Fred Golan was there and he went up to Tim and he said, uh, you know, Tim, I know it's been quite a process, but it's really been worth it. You've done a, a great job. And, uh, you know, you're hugely responsible for the success of this show. And Tim said to Fred, well, remember back in season one, when I was offering all my opinions, uh, Fred, you said to me, don't stop, keep it coming. And Fred said, I said that, well, God, don't tell Graham. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and of course, Fred then did tell me about this. Um, but yeah, you know, and, and that was one of the things that happened over the course of the series was just having a little faith in the process that sometimes it'd be difficult. We'd be banging heads. Uh, there'd be some, you know, hard moments, but we just started to see, well, that's just the way it is on this show and it works out and there's nothing personal to it. It's uh, just people trying to do the best job they can. And the one thing, well, many things we had going for us, but one of the big things we had going for us is that we had all these people and everyone was pulling in one direction and that direction was Elmore Leonard. And so at least we knew where we wanted to go stylistically, tonally, story-wise, character-wise. Um, and that, that always helped us. We could always come back and say, okay, what would Elmore do? One last question. You know, we're an awards website, so I've got to ask you about uh, two of your two Emmy winners so far. And that's Margot Martindale and Jeremy Davies. Your reaction when they won, as well as um, just working with those two. Um, well, I'll start with Jeremy uh, because he won most recently. He won, I believe, for yeah, that was season three. Um, you know, an incredibly charismatic and um, creative actor, and brought a lot to it. Uh, has his own process. Uh, you know, we would joke that after season two, when you'd see Dickie in prison, it looked like Jeremy was cutting his own hair uh, without a mirror. And it, but that sort of added to the crazy Dickie take on things. Um, you know, I like the fact that, you know, we had only two pops of him in seasons, you know, five and six, and both were scenes with Raylan in the prison where Raylan gets some information from him. And, um, I thought it was cool that his very last line was was screaming the name Loretta because she had been such the bane of his existence in seasons two, in season two, and in three. Um, Margot, you know, uh, that's just one of the great gifts of the casting gods. Um, she was interested in the show. She auditioned for Mags. Um, Cami Patton sent me the link. I looked at it. I said, I, yeah, she's the one. And then um, Adam Arkin, who was directing that first episode in season two, uh, brought me and Fred and Sarah uh, into the editing room to show us the scene where uh, Mags poisons Walt McCready, Loretta's father. And uh, we looked at each other and said, well, okay, now we got a season. Um, and, you know, that's just one of those great things of the character and the actor really just coming together. And, you know, I talked to Margo, uh, as, as, you know, we, we, we still stay in touch and, uh, um, you know, both realized that that really was this kind of golden time. Um, and we're so lucky we had her. You helped her out as much as she helped you because, I mean, she's just been everywhere since that show. Yeah, deservedly so. I mean, that's, that's one of the, you know, uh, sweetest things of, of working on this show is, um, seeing actors get to do work they really enjoy and it having an effect in their career. I mean, one of the things we're most uh, excited about is, uh, is Caitlin Deaver who plays Loretta McCready and just seeing her grow up from this 13 year old kid in season two to someone who was driving herself to the set by the end. Um, so that, that's, that's been a real thrill. Well, this has been a thrill to talk to you today and, um, we appreciate that, but just for the six seasons, somebody that's a, a fan of the show as well as writing about the show quite regularly. I, I think on behalf of all of the, the fans of the show, we just appreciate all the hard work you put into it. Oh, thank you very much. We had a, we had a great ride. We're really glad we got to do it.